Asha. I also get to introduce this, this lovely woman of God here. Anybody thankful for her? I am. She's beautiful. My better half. Amen. Good morning, family. How are you guys today? I am well. You know, I got to give the Lord a testimony. For those of most people probably have realized by now, I'm expecting. Um, and uh, we're getting a puppy in December. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> no, but I had a really, really tough pregnancy with my first. And this has been so wonderful. I have felt so good. The Lord has redeemed this experience for me. I feel like I'm way out. Makes me feel vulnerable. <laughs> um, I'm glad y'all put up with me. I want to do something really important right now. Um, Pastor and Paula are in Florida. They're enjoying some time away. And it's like 80-something degrees where they are. So can we turn around? Which camera are we on right here? We're going to look at this camera right here. I want everybody to blow them a big old raspberry. Can you look? <laughs> Get that out of the way. It's important. Um, me and Ben are leaving today, so you can blow your raspberries at me now. <laughs> um, so this morning, uh, my key scripture is, comes from Proverbs 23, verse 7. It says, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. Can we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you for this precious time together. God, let us never, ever take for granted the moments that we get to gather with your people, the moments where we get to hear your word preached and spoken into the atmosphere, spoken publicly. Well, we are grateful for this um, privilege, Lord, and we, we truly view it that way. Lord, I ask that you would unlock minds and open hearts today to receive your word, Father, let what I speak today be anointed and come by the power of the Holy Ghost and not of me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, so back before Christmas, my husband, he owns a business here in town, and he was um, searching for some leadership material to send to his managers. He likes to contribute to their um, continued development as leaders. Um, and they're not just employees to him. He cares that they grow. And so he's looking for some material to send to him, and he's listening to this TED Talk. Does anybody know what a TED Talk is? Oh, really? Not very many people. Um, it's like Netflix for motivational speeches, basically. There's just all kinds of stuff on there, good and bad. It's not Christian, so we'd watch what you watch. Uh, but he's listening to this one, and, and he's... Uh, I'm overhearing it because he does things like watch TED Talks. I do things like look for craft ideas on Pinterest to weigh me down and, and make me feel bad for the things I never complete. Um, <laughs> Pinterest is just a place where you can feel bad about the time you don't have to do all the things you want to do. So, <laughs> but he's listening to the TED Talk, and I'm like, that is powerful. <laughs> like, that is that is scripture. She doesn't know it, but she's preaching. So I was like, I'm going to preach that <laughs> the next time I preach. So that's, that's where it began. Um, and this morning I was up praying and um, just that the Lord would speak what you all need. You know, it does the world no good if you leave this place the same as you came in. And so my hope is to edify you today, to strengthen you in your faith, and that you leave here um, empowered to go and do God's will. So I feel like the Lord showed me that God's people are like maxed, emotionally and mentally maxed. Has anybody in this room felt maxed out, just like that credit card that just can't hold any more pennies on it? You're just maxed out. And um, God 
calls for us to live in the overflow. And if we are mentally and emotionally maxed, then we're not healthy physically, and we're not thinking um, from a place of uh, generosity, we are surviving. And it is not God's will that we just survive because we are victorious through him. We cannot pour from an empty cup. No matter how hard you try, if you've got an empty glass, you can shake it as hard as you want and nothing is coming out. Work as hard as you want, squeeze it as hard as you want. Ben laughs at me because uh, I try to get every little bit of toothpaste out of the tube. Does anybody else do that? Okay, so I take the back of my toothbrush, I lay this tube down on the counter and I go, push that little bit of toothpaste up in there. Anybody else do that? But no matter how hard you squeeze an empty cup or how hard you shake it, nothing's coming out. So we cannot pour from an empty cup. And so today, my desire is to edge us closer to the prosperity of soul. And our soul is our mind, our will, and emotions. And the Apostle John said, I would that everything prospers for you. All things prosper, even as your soul prospers. But if your soul is not prospering, the rest of the stuff can't prosper. We've got to get it in alignment. So what happens when our soul prospers? It's, and I found this quote, and it says, it is on God's heart for our internal world, what's inside, to define and impact our external world, not the other way around. So often believers allow the state of their internal world to be defined by external circumstances. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about stress. Familiar with the word? Probably more than you'd like to be. <laughs> Anybody know what stress is? I might be stress sweating a little bit up here now. <laughs> My husband covers his face. <clears throat> so this guy walks into a coffee shop, and it's shortly after Thanksgiving, and he goes there often. And so he walks in the barista at the counter. He's like, hey, how was your Thanksgiving holiday? You know, how did things go for you? And he goes, oh, it, it went fine. Um, we had a lot of family over. So it was kind of stressful for the wife, and honestly, she was... She was getting a little overwhelmed. And he goes, oh, yeah? He said, but I was able to help her out. So she's like, oh, man, what a, what a great guy he is, right? Um, and he, she, so she inquires, so what did you do to help your wife so much? And he said, well, she was really needing some peace and quiet in the kitchen so that she could finish the meal peacefully. And so I went in and took the batteries out of all the smoke detectors in the house so that she could cook in peace. <laughs> uh, sometimes the fix for stress is just that simple. Just take the batteries out of the smoke detectors. So the, in case you're wondering, the TED Talk that I watched was, uh, is by the author of the book, The Upside of Stress. <laughs> Everybody's like, mm, there's an upside to this? Um, her name's Kelly McGonigal, and give her credit because she, she put some of these facts and figures together and, that I'm going to share. But she talked about this study, <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to dig into a little bit to some science here, so if anyone needs to run and get a cup of coffee, come back in so you can be alert and aware. And pay attention. You're welcome to. Uh, but the University of Wisconsin did a study, and they followed 30,000 adults over eight years span of time. So they connected with them at the beginning, and then they followed up with them over the course of eight years. And they asked them two questions. Number one, how much stress do you encounter regularly? And number two, do you believe stress is harmful to your health? A couple good questions. So if I were to ask you, do you experience a lot of stress? Would you? Can you raise your hand? Do you have a stressful job? Yeah. And then how many of you uh, believe stress is bad for you? Stress is not good for your health, right? So those, here's the result. Those who said they experienced a lot of stress of that group, 43% were more likely to die from stress-related causes. 
but, there's a big but here, only if they viewed stress as harmful to their health. So does anybody want to take back their raised hand that stress is harmful to them? Put that back in my pocket. Um, those who do not believe stress was harmful to their health had the absolute lowest risk of dying due to stress-related causes, even than the ones who lived relatively low stress lives. So the conclusion here is that over a span of eight years, 182,000 Americans died prematurely, not from stress, but the belief that stress was bad for them. That's mind-blowing, right? Proverbs 23, 7 again, as a man thinks, so is he. For years, I've read scriptures like John 16, 33, in this world you shall have tribulation. That's a promise? <laughs> Woo! That's one of my favorite promises in the Bible. <laughs> we talk about the promises of God, but we don't talk about that one very often, do we? In this world you will have tribulation. But they're running concurrent along scriptures like Psalm 91, 16, that says, with long life, you will satisfy me. So, Lord, you're going to give me a life full of tribulation, and then it's going to be long? <laughs> like, I think I'm missing something here, Lord. That doesn't sound extremely satisfying to live a life of tribulation. The Bible also talks about a man is, is given a certain number of years, and it's full of trouble. It's in the book of Job. And uh, so I'm like, Lord, I'm... I'm missing something here. And listening to this talk, I realize that the way we've come to view stress in our society, that it's bad for us, that it makes us sick, that it has to isolate us, we've come to where we, we seek to avoid stress at all costs. It becomes part of our decision-making process. So we're faced with an opportunity. Well, how much stress is this going to bring into my life? Like, what is it going to cost me? What's it going to cost me in time? What's it going to cost me in mental capacity? Is it going to wear me out? So when we read scriptures that tell us that we will endure hardships and stress in life, we feel kind of like a victim. I think a lot of Christians are like, well, this is my lot in life, and I'm a good, solid Christian, so I'm just going to grip my teeth and bear with it. Because I have faith and my feet are planted on the rock. But that is not the life God called us to. God never intended us to be a victim. It is not in his nature to subject us to be, to, or to be unkind to us. So, I'm missing something, right? Right? There's a Christian psychologist, her name is Dr. Carolyn Leaf, and she says, if you can change your mind about stress, you can change your body's response to stress. So Proverbs 23, 7, according to science, is actually true. Go figure, God's word is true. I can take him at his word. Yes, we can. Philippians 4, 8 says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Yes. You know, it makes me think of <clears throat> the funeral service for the, the man in town that nobody liked, and the minister was called upon to preach his sermon, well, his service, so... At a funeral, you're supposed to say nice things about people. But really, nobody had anything nice to say about this guy. But he found something praiseworthy. He, he followed this Philippian scripture because he told everyone, he said, he was a good whistler. He found the praiseworthy. He found the virtue. So if anything be praiseworthy, if there's even a seed in your situation that you can find that's praiseworthy, 
that's worth a good report, the Bible calls us to focus and think on that. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That word perfect means complete and lacking nothing. It doesn't mean that nothing goes wrong in your life. It means that in all of it, there's a wholeness and a completeness within you. Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. So we can, according to the scripture, choose life. We can choose joy. We get the opportunity to choose peace. The things that we believe not only affect us. This is a cool little tidbit I picked up too. So generations are affected by our thoughts, our habits, our fears, and our unbeliefs. There is a study done on epigenetics, and it's found in Time Magazine. But the conclusion was that our dispositions, our bad habits, our anxiety, and even our hatred of cats can affect our children before they're even born. Once again, God's word, choose life that your descendants may live. 2 Corinthians 6.5 says, Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself above the word of God. So for a long time now, our view of our troubles, our issues, our problems, stress, whatever you want to call it, anxiety, has come above the word of God. Like, I need to quit being anxious because it is bad for my heart. That's the way we think, right? But the word of God says that I don't have to be anxious, that I can be anxious for nothing. And that whether it affects my heart or not, God will keep me and I can choose life by the words I speak and the things I think and, and meditate on. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. It doesn't say, get busy and find out if I really am God. No, it says, settle down, be still, and just know it. Choose to know that I am God. Choose it. Choose that thought path. Choose that pathway in your brain that I am God, and my word is true, and that it's forever settled in heaven. The Bible says it's forever settled in heaven. It wasn't just true for Moses. It wasn't just true for Abraham or David or the Apostle Paul, but it's forever settled in heaven. There is no argument. There is no defense for the other side. It is settled. Taking every thought captive requires that stillness that the psalmist talks about. We have got to get still enough that we can choose to know, that we can choose our thoughts. I think sometimes we get busy fixing our problems that we're not being still because we're afraid that if we're still, we're gonna think about our problems more. Anybody else like a busyholic? I get home from working for the church and guess what I do? I work some more. I just like sitting still and looking at my house and looking at all the things I have to do sounds like torture to me rather than just doing the things. <laughs> Anybody else in here like that? Just do the things. Don't sit and stare at them and waller in how much you have to do, right? But God needs me to be still. I need to be able to sit in my messy house and let it go. <laughs> Let it go, baby. <laughs> yeah. 
So in this study that I've been talking about, obviously there's the broad result. Like less people, people who viewed stress differently had a, less ri a lower risk of dying from stress-related causes and illnesses and stuff. But what was so astonishing was the reaction in the heart of these two different groups of people. So typically when there's a stress response, your blood vessels in your heart constrict, okay? And so sustaining constricted blood vessels in your heart for an extended period of time can lead to cardiovascular disease. Am I telling right, true things here, medical people? Okay. So it constricts, you're stressed, your heart's working extra hard, and it's not healthy over a long period of time. However, in the group of people that viewed stress as helpful, the blood vessels in their heart actually remained relaxed. All because of a thought. So their heart changed its natural course of action by something they thought. So when this group that viewed stress as a helpful thing had this reaction in their heart, it's very, very similar to what happens in your body in times of joy. So it's not just no stress. It's not just your heart's not revving up and, and getting all panicky and anxious and hurting itself. It's like similar to a state of joy or moments of courage. I'm going to have like brain matter oozing on the stage here in a minute. So I'm once again brought to the truth of God's word. Like everything I heard in, this, in all these studies and I'm like, that's the word of God. Like that's what his word says. That's what it promises. James 1, 2 through 4 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Knowing that goes back again to what we know. The testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and lacking nothing. Does anyone else in here need a little dose of perfect lacking nothing? Pick me! So I've read this scripture often in life, and like, how, God? God, how? How do I get there? How do I count it all joy? And it's because I need to find what, what's praiseworthy. I need to grow up a little bit and say, if you allowed it, it's good for me. This is good for me, Lord. This is not going to affect my heart because it's good for me. Because you are a good God and you do all things well. And if you saw me on the other side of it, you know that I'm better for it. He wouldn't have allowed it if you're going to come out on the other side even more of a wreck. That's not God. That's not his nature. He can't do that. We must choose to take him at his word. We must always start first with the belief that God's word is the final authority. You find yourself freaking out. Stop and open up the word of God. Find his word for you. Find that piece of scripture that you can know, that you can commit to memory, that you can be still and know. Deuteronomy 8.3 says, So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone. But man lives life, the essence of life, lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When Satan was tempted in the wilderness, he had been fasting. I mean, when Satan. When Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus was the one being tempted in the wilderness. Jesus had been fasting. We just came off of a 21-day fast. There are moments of weakness in a fast. Imagine 40 days, water only, the kind of weakness you must feel. But what did Jesus do? Goes back to the word of God. Says, Satan, 
God's word says, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We should never wait on science to prove the word of God. But I tell you what, I am so grateful to live in a day and a time where we get to see God's word unfold in the realm of science. And we get to see the effects of what God's word means when it says, as a man thinketh, so is he. It's just incredible and once again takes us back to, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. One more note on stress before we go on to the next part. Has anyone ever heard of oxytocin? So it's called like the hugging hormone. Like some people joke that we should like see if we can get it in like pill form or like make people snort it because it's the caring hormone. It causes people to care more for the people around them. We need a little bit of that in our culture. So, um, but oxytocin, that's just a, a small part of what it does in your body and what its purpose is. So it's a neurohormone, it fine tunes your brain's social instincts and primes you to do things that strengthens close relationships. It causes you to crave physical contact with loved ones. It increases empathy for others. And it causes you to be more willing to offer help and support to those that you're close with. But here's the real kicker. Oxytocin is a stress hormone. It is as much a part of your stress response as adrenaline is. So when this hormone is released in your body, it's actually motivating you to seek support. It is saying to you, reach out, get somebody to hold on to, call your pastor, call your best bud, don't hold it in. God wired us for community. He wired us to need each other. And what happens when this, cause, when this hormone causes you to reach for help and causes you to pick up the phone and call somebody or causes you to, to say, hey, I need a hug. Can you give me a hug? I just need a hug. My husband needs lots of hugs. He's a physical affection guy. I'll be cooking dinner and he comes in and he's like, I'm like, chop it and he's like and I'm like this is great I love you because I'm not that person I had to make a new year's resolution one year to give more hugs because I was so not a hugger I was like you know they say that there's nothing a hundred hugs a day can't cure it is because of the release of that hormone, I guess, is the science behind it. But I was just not a hugger, and I was like, I need to hug people. It's okay for people to touch me. <laughs> I won't die. I had a friend once when she was younger, when she went to get her hair cut, she'd pass out because people were touching her. That's a serious, I, was, I didn't have that issue, but it does happen. But whenever we actually do reach out, we receive more of this hormone in our body. So we get the hormone in, our body, hormone in our body, it says reach out. You stuff it down in, you regress. You actually take the steps to reach out and talk to somebody, you get more of that hormone in your system. It's this incredible perpetuating system that God has placed in our bodies. And it's anti-inflammatory, and it heals whatever stress problems it has caused, or that the other stress hormones has caused in your body. So if your heart has been at all damaged, it regenerates the cells in your heart to make your heart better, to make your heart like new. We are wired for community, people. We need each other. When you are going through a time of stress and maybe you can't see that it's good for you. 
Maybe you can't find your way out. You need a friend in your life that will tell you you're going to get through this. Kaylee, you needed those voices, didn't you? You're going to get through this. You're going to be better at the end of this. Trust me, brighter days are coming. You need those voices because it doesn't just do you good to hear it. It causes something physically in your body that your body needs. We physically have a need for one another. We have got to exist in community. If you are stuck and you don't have relationships, or maybe you're afraid of group settings, or maybe you're afraid of interaction because it might just take you deeper than you want to go, and it might just expose too much, you've got to get past it. Your body craves it. Your body needs it. And your spirit man needs your body to be whole. You need to be a whole being. We need to get to the place where we can live from overflow. Sometimes the only way your cup can get filled is by coming together with your brothers and sisters. Look at your neighbor, say, I need you. Look at your other neighbor, say, I need you. We are the body of Christ. We are one. If we become separated, that body is unhealthy. Right? Like the only thing we should be clipping off of our bodies is fingernails and hair. <laughs> we don't need to be detaching other things, right? No, that's not healthy. A healthy body is complete, and we want to be that healthy body. Psalm 139, verse 14 says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Isn't that amazing? Another scripture. Hang on, I gotta go backwards. Ecclesiastes 9:4. It says, But whoever is joined with all the living has hope. If you are joined to the living, thriving body of Christ, you have hope. Don't ever, ever let yourself get to a place of hopelessness. The end of that scripture, Psalm 139, 14, that says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, we quote that all the time. And it is so true. Like, you, you see these studies, you see what the body does when we love each other, you see what the body does when we change our mindset on stress, all these different things, and we are fearfully and wonderfully made. But the second half says, marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. And my soul knows it. My soul gets it. It gets it down deep. My mind, my will, my emotions can know very well that I am wonderfully made and I can trust God in times of stress because he has made preparations for it from the beginning of time. From the moment he spoke life into this universe, he made preparations for what you would face in this life. Our bodies are wired that way. The goal in this walk with Christ, the goal in this life, should not be to avoid stressful situations. I know for a fact I have missed God opportunities because they looked stressful because it looked like too much. I felt incapable. But the goal in this life is not to get by without stress. We need to realize that our thoughts have been influenced by the world, by the culture's view, instead of God's word. We need the light of his scripture to come to us. And so I don't leave you here today saying, go change your mind about stress. Go 
And the next time you're in a stressful situation, you just repeat, this is good for me, 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 right? That's not, I mean, it could be helpful, and I have begun to view stress differently. And if you're able to realize that when your heart starts pounding in a stressful situation, that is gearing you up for the challenge of the situation, like, oh, okay, I'm in go mode right? I got this. And the increased blood flow sends more oxygen to your brain. Like, it's great to know those things. It's great to, to say, okay, my body's gearing up for something big, and we've got this. But that's not enough. We as the people of God, we've got something more. We have the blood of Jesus Christ. Did you know that the blood of Jesus is not simply for the cleansing of sin? The blood of Jesus offers protection. It offers to transform our minds. It offers to do the work for us. Now that's a deal I can get on board with. If you sign me up for a job and say, hey, I got this great opportunity for you. It's going to transform your life. You're going to not be stressed. You're going to be able to handle hardship with courage and with joy. And it's not going to cost you a thing. You're not going to be the one paying for it. Jesus' blood is the rescue. Jesus' blood is our answer. I remember in the early days of COVID, I had a baby. And I didn't want to be fearful. I didn't want to be numbered among the afraid. I wanted to have courage, and I wanted to see and believe that nothing bad would happen to my family. But I knew that God doesn't exempt us from trials and tribulations and troubles. And so instead of praying, God, just get me out of here. <laughs> God, just get me out of here. I pleaded the blood of Jesus over my home and over my family every night. Lord, anoint my mind with your blood. Lord, there's a lot of information swirling around right there and I, out there, and I need your wisdom. I need to know. I need your blood to cover my mind so I don't lose it. I need your blood to cover my mind so I don't walk around in fear. I refuse to make decisions in my life based out of fear. It is a poor master. So I plead the blood of Jesus over my mind, over my family, over my baby, over my home, because it works. The blood of Jesus is a rescue. We are transformed by the renewing of our mind. And when his blood covers our mind, the transforming work to begin, begins. And his word becomes unlocked to us. We open up the word of God and we can say, that is for me. That is true and I know it. In my thinker, it doesn't make sense. But in my gut, in my spirit, man, I know that it's true. We need to start by letting the blood of God cleanse us from all sin. That's the starting point. But don't think the work of the blood stops there. If I could have the musicians come. Our minds are the gateway to our soul and to our body and to our spirit. If we can get our minds right, we've done something big. The very life of God is in the blood of Jesus. When we realize that there is life in the blood of Jesus, 
We invoke the blood of Jesus over our homes. And we invoke the blood of Jesus over our families and over our generations. And if you don't know how to do this and you've never done this before, you just speak, Father, I plead the blood of Jesus over my mind. God, cover me. Set my thoughts on things above and not on things of this world. Help me to grow past stinking mindsets and all the thoughts that did not come from you, Lord. I plead the blood. Plead the blood over your children. We are made overcomers by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So plead the blood and talk about it. Talk about what God has done for you. Just like Ben mentioned, during our declaration time, this man is telling his life story and it seems riddled with hardship and difficulty and stress. But instead it was a testimony. He said, but God has been so good to me. No matter what comes out of your mouth, you reach out to a neighbor, you say, I'm struggling. This hurts. I'm experiencing loss and it hurts. I'm broken and it hurts. End your sentence with, but God is rich in mercy. God has been so good to me. And even if he were to never answer another prayer or do another thing for me, it is enough. What he's done for me is enough. His blood, we're getting ready to sing a song that says his blood is the rescue. His blood is the healing. His blood is enough. Would you stand with me? If you need Jesus to transform your mind, if you need the blood of Jesus applied, would you come to the front? In the Old Testament, when Moses was preparing to lead God's people to freedom, first thing God told him to do was go find a lamb, slay it, and put the door, the blood on your doorpost. doorpost was the gateway to the home and our mind is the gateway to our soul we've got to get the blood applied to the doorposts of our mind so if you need the Lord to transform your mind if you're going through something today whatever you need know that you need the blood of Jesus and you need this group of people to hold your hand and help you apply the blood to your doorposts. So would you come and let us pray for you this morning? We serve a good, good father. A good, good father. Go ahead. Your blood is a rescue to the first things life. Your blood is the hopeless and broken, your blood is enough. Jesus is enough. Your blood is a shelter in the middle of my storm. Your blood.
bless you all this morning. I seal the word of God upon your hearts and your lives and declare that he is good and that you will see his goodness this week, no matter the circumstances. Be blessed and go in Jesus' name. We love you. Keep us in your prayers as we travel this week, and we will see you here on Wednesday night for prayer. God is doing great things.